Okay, welcome everybody to Flight School Connector. I know that we've got everybody just uh, joining into the call here. Perfect. So as you're all joining again, welcome to Flight School Connector. Um, we are really excited today for this topic. You got it. Oh yeah. And if you guys could make sure, please do mute your microphones as you come in, and then of course we'll certainly give you opportunities to raise your hand and and ask questions. Um, we got some great, great, great topic today and great information. Uh, and so let's go ahead and just do some quick intros, um, and then we'll do the the little bit of just a little bit of business stuff at the beginning. So uh, of course I'm Chris Moser, Senior Director of Flight Training here at You Can Fly. Um, with me is uh, Stephen Schroeder, our coordinator, as always, running the show behind the scenes. You get to see him here. You don't get to see him on Don't Get Rusty. It's a it's a whole mystery there. So yeah, don't reveal. Um, and then we are really pleased today to have. Um, uh, of course, our executive director, Elizabeth Tennyson from our You Can Fly program. And most importantly, our special guest, Mike Ginter, our vice president of airports and state advocacy. He has got so much information. And I know from talking to you guys that you've had issues pop up. Mike is the right person and he's got the network of people to help you out when we need it. So um, I think this is going to be a good one. But before we get started on that, let's just do a quick review of our sponsor. I want to thank Sporty's Pilot Shop for sponsoring us. And just in case you don't know, they do have a dealer program. So if you're looking to start a pilot shop at your school, consider them. Check it out at sporties.com slash dealer. You can see all the benefits right there on the slide. All right, let's hit the topics uh, for today. Today's agenda, we're going to talk, uh, Mike's going to give us an overview of AOPA airport advocacy, kind of explaining what it is they do um, and and sort of the, the things that they cover. Then we'll talk about some best practices for building a healthy airport. Uh, and then sort of intermixed with that as well is uh, he's going to do an overview of some of the really hot common airport issues that are happening today and how AOPA is involved. And then the last bit we'll make sure we get to is how to get help and resolve your issues. So if you're having any kind of issues at your airport um, with the kind of things that Mike's talking about, we're going to give you the steps, the basic steps of how to do that and who to ask for help here at AOPA. Uh, and so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Mike, do you want to go ahead and introduce you again? It's Mike Ginter, our VP of Airports and Advocacy. If you would, please um, start us off and, and start. Tell us what you do. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate being invited to join the, the connector today. Um, so I'm the vice president of airports and state advocacy, and I'm, I'm calling in today from our DC office. Uh, I'm about two blocks from uh, Union Station and right around the corner from the Capitol. Um, I run the team of regional managers for AOPA that are uh, remotely employed all over the country. And I've got two de dedicated uh, airport experts as well on the staff. So there's 10 of us at AOPA, including myself, that work airport issues and we work the state legislation, state advocacy business. Um, and just a quick side note on that, the state legislative business, uh, I think we're the only National Aviation Association that has a state lobbying arm. And this year we, we managed to get 13 bills that were very good for GA passed in, in the states, and we blocked about six of them that were would have been really bad. And uh, anyway, so that's a very busy time for us, first six months of the year. A uh, year-round job for us, though, is airport advocacy, and um, I just wanted to let you know that we're the team of people that do that stuff to help out uh, all the tenants of the airports, uh, increase the volume of the voice of the tenants to airport management when that's needed on, on all manner of issues. And the chart that's displayed here shows uh, just a global overview of what, what we do uh, as of today. We're working 117 different airport issues around the country, and uh, as of today, we've resolved mostly successfully 220 issues since January of uh, last year, 2020. Um, and that uh, is just a little bit of a pulse check to show you how busy we are on the airport business. Uh, those are issues uh, that that are, cover nine different topics that are listed on the bar graph to the right there. Uh, rules and regs are the one that keeps us busy the most. Rules, regs, and minimum standards. And uh, we've had uh, been involved in 84 of those since we started tracking these issues. 63 issues dealt with airport development, and that's uh, that's basically uh, uh, airport layout changes, uh, uh, zoning or near the airport issues that would impact mostly negatively the operations at the airport. Uh, and then we are in, involved today in 48 different closure threats. 
Um, everybody remembers Migs Field. Right now, our frontline big fight is uh, Reed Hillview Airport in California. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then we deal quite a bit uh, with members calling us about lease issues, mostly hangar leases, and we uh, we deal with those. Uh, so I will tell you right up front is in many, many cases when our members call us with these issues, uh, the largest product they get from us is an education, sometimes not what they want to hear. Uh, but that's uh, part of our job is to make sure everybody knows what the book says and how the system works. And uh, that's what keeps us busy. So that's the stuff that we're uh, dealing with every day in the airport uh, advocacy side for AOPA. And let's go ahead and go to the next chart. All right, great. Thanks, Mike. There we go. Um, and so what we would like to do is right now, and we're going to sort of do it a little differently than we normally do. I'd like you, um, everybody, to tell us what your pressing issues are. If you just want to give us a brief description of what it is, I will collect those, and then we're going to use those later during our Q&A to kind of kick things off. So if you're having any issues at your airport, stuff you're having challenges with, whatever it might be, whether it's some of the stuff that Mike talked about with zoning or uh, dealing with airport management or leases or any of that sort of stuff, please throw it in the chat. Um, I'll be watching that throughout the presentation and then collecting those. Um, and so... That'll be good to go, and then again, we'll pick it up, and I think Mike's probably going to hit a number of those, and then you'll certainly have time at the end to ask him specific questions. All right, let's go ahead and jump to the next one. So I know, Mike, you wanted to talk about airport issues, so um, yeah, what is your, so, what's your advice uh, here? Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, definitely plug in your issues in the chat window. I see a couple of them popping in now. Um, what I'll say before I get into this uh, list of issues that dominate most of our time with airports is uh, we uh, discovered a year and a half ago that we were very busy with these airport issues. We've been busy with airport issues for, for decades, but we uh, decided to put a project management software in place that allows us to track it. Uh, when, it when We call them airport cases, uh, nothing to do with legal cases, but it's uh, airport cases or uh, issues. Um, we track when the case opens, we track who, who sent it to us, we we uh, put together a five-step process that's generic, but lets us guide our, our uh, resolution of those issues. And I'll say that the first thing about that is every time we get an airport issue in the front door, we, we basically take that issue into the hangar and we give it a full-blown extensive annual inspection, uh, which is to say we talk to everybody that could possibly have an equity in that issue. We look at the books, we look at the finances, we look at the local laws. We read uh, minutes from public, uh, uh, you know, t city council or county council meetings, and we literally get 360 degree smart on the issue uh, before we engage. And then we uh, we're always in including our members uh, at the airport that's involved into these discussions. And, but we have a pretty good process and it works. And we're always trying to re refine that to go through it a little bit faster because there's so much work to be done. But what I have on this chart is uh, basically a snapshot of uh, the main issues. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you that zoning is uh, the, first, uh, the first problem we see develop at an airport where there's going to be big problems down the road. Uh, if the zoning is uh, being considered to be changed, usually because a developer wants to develop something next to the airport or in the runway protection zone or, or build a high rise uh, right off the turn to final or base, uh, that happens all the time, and thankfully the FAA has great regulations in place, and most states have uh, state laws in place that require uh, obstructions uh, or developments to be uh, reconciled with the impact to the airport. Um, as most of you may know, an airport that is federally funded is required by the grant assurances uh, to operate the airport uh, in accordance with the compliance manual, which which requires them to protect the airspace and the, and the land space around the airport. So there is no incompatible land use development. But as you can imagine, there's lots of airports that have uh, either the, uh, the, the local governor uh, governance of the airport doesn't understand the value of the airport. It doesn't understand airport management. Maybe the airport managers uh, dual headed as the uh, Public Works Director uh, has no, no, knows nothing about the airport. There's, all airports are different, as you, as you may know. But uh, we try to engage those uh, local zoning boards and educate them on what's going on with the airport. And usually we push them into the process of the FAA Part 77 obstruction evaluation process, which, number one, slows the whole thing down. And number two, uh, is a very effective way for the federal government to be involved with the state and local authorities to educate them on what they can and can't do with their generally with their publicly funded airport. 
where an airport's not publicly funded, we we have less tools to fight that, uh, and it becomes more of a local local fight to educate the people that are making the zoning decisions to to not do it for the good of the the town, city, county, or whatever. So if and when zoning is approved that allows this development, uh, obstructions appear where they shouldn't. Residential developments appear where they shouldn't. Uh, it's generally called suburban sprawl, but uh, it's funny how residences are always attracted or developers are attracted to the airport. I don't know why, but that's what happens. Zoning changes, residential developments pop up, obstructions pop up, and what a surprise, three to five years later, noise complaints pop up of these crazy air airplanes that are doing touch and goes at all hours of the day and night. And uh, those noise complaints are very manageable early on, but eventually public perceptions change about the airport. They might go from very friendly to the airport to neutral to very negative. And when that scale tips, the political pressure goes with it and you end up with uh, the calls to close the airport and all of a sudden the the local elected leaders are no longer in favor of protecting the airport. So what I just listed there is about a 30 to 40 year timeline of the death of an airport. And it's a death by a thousand cuts and it always starts with incompatible land use development. Um, so uh, if you are at an airport that has a ton of residential development in the under the downwind, under the base leg uh, or whatever, uh, that your airport managers probably got a noise complaint process in place, which is good. Every one of these steps in the death of a uh, of an airport ha has uh, tactics that we employ to help the manager and the local elected leaders oppose those things or or uh, mitigate those things. And once you get to the noise complaint phase, it's usually uh, make sure you have a good process to hear the noise complaints, make sure the community knows they're heard and then have periodic uh, community town halls to, to tell the community what's going on with the noise complaints. So uh, AOPA has always advocated for a very uh, fly friendly program where we uh, we ask airports to put in place uh, course rules or minimum altitudes or you know, maybe some noise abatement procedures that are recommended. They're all voluntary, but it goes a long way to, to assuage the concerns of a, of a local uh, community. So that's a list of some of the airport issues uh, that we deal with. It's certainly not all inclusive. Uh, hopefully it inspires you all to drop some comments into the chat to let us know what you're dealing with at your airports. And uh, in the end, as Chris mentioned, I'll definitely uh, capture those issues and your contact info and, and we'll follow up. And if we have to make an airport issue and a case out of it, we'll do it and we'll get you into our little system. So let's go to the next chart, Chris. Awesome, thanks, Mike. And it's like, and I think that really, I love the part here you talked about too, is a good guide for all these owners and managers to be watching, to keep an eye out. So if you see you're somewhere in that phase to, to really be proactive about it rather than just let it happen. All so right. here we go, so the, yeah, the healthy airport. So uh, the big picture is very simple uh, and that the airport is an ecosystem and all parts of it have to work. It's, it's an aircraft, you know, the fuel system has to work, the oil pressure system has to work, the, the enough Bernoulli's over the wing have to be there and qualified pilot, you know, and all that stuff. So it's no different. Uh, there are, uh, and every airport is different. I, I know that's a, a cliche that we beat up all the time, but they are all different. And the best airports that we see um, have uh, a nice vertical alignment between the airport manager uh, with the county governance or city governance, whatever the, the airport authority, uh, the governance structure is. There's a nice alignment there and uh, and the local elected leaders and the uh, airport governance understand what the airport does for the community. Uh, the airport manager in the perfect airport is trained to some level, maybe uh, maybe a uh, uh, certified manager with uh, AAAE or or some other uh, uh, professional training that's available out there. Uh, the worst airports are the ones that uh, either are very wealthy uh, or very poor based on the demographics of where the airport is and, and or have a, have a lot of pressure against them from one issue out in East Hamptons, uh, Long Island. Uh, it's It's not federally obligated. Uh, so and they have a massive noise problem with uh, mostly the, the uh, commercial helicopters coming in and out from Manhattan. Um, we uh, we characterize that micro problem as the 0.1% versus the 0.01% because it's uh, the complainers are in these beautiful mansions and they don't fly 
And the ones that are causing the noise are coming in and out of Manhattan on Thursday and Friday night after a week of work and they're coming home. And they, it's it's a, a very, very busy airspace system for a few hours every uh, Thursday or Friday night. And then, then again, Saturday, Sunday and Monday going back to work. So uh, the healthy ecosystem is the key and all parts of it need to be healthy for the airport to survive. You could have a perfect system in all but one area and it ruins a lot of the possibilities. Um, of course, we love. Mike, would you say? I was just going to say, would you say here too with that ecosystem, especially for our flight school um, uh, guests here, is it? It's even within the actual airport itself. It's not just it's what the flight school, it's the management, it's the FBO. Is it, would you kind of go along with that that kind of tap yeah, here for them? Absolutely. It's all it's all parts of it. We've seen airports that had uh, all, all pieces of the all all parts of the recipe were perfect, except for the pilots were so upset say with either one other tenant or with the airport manager that it kind of ruins the whole thing and and of course that's where we get involved very quickly to try to right size the complaints and we, we like to hear them but then we try to educate them on on how things are not as bad as they think you know as soon as people think that's definitely going to be bad and terrible uh that grows and spreads and it's just bad it's fake news frankly <laughs> so uh Anyway, uh, we uh, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, we love to help airports uh, thrive and grow. Uh, obviously, the airports are the off ramps to the national air, airspace system. They're as important to a town as a, an off ramp is to a major interstate. It's the lifeblood to bring in business. It's got economic impact that, that is generally positive. And uh, and gen as you all probably know in the flight school world, general aviation is booming right now. We certainly see that at AOPA. And uh, and I think a lot of flight schools are seeing that they're very busy. Hopefully you all are experiencing that. Uh, but we all like to uh, walk into an issue like this. And this is the messaging we give to our members and to the tenants we deal with is strive for good relationships, deal in good faith with the folks you're, you're talking to uh, rather than coming in with accusations and uh, insults and then seeing how you can improve it from there. So that's just a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, but that's uh, if you want to jump in there, Chris, anything else to add to that? And I, the biggest thing I really just wanted to highlight, too, is something that we discussed uh, as we were prepping, which is that the key here is that if you are starting to have these problems, more than likely you are better off than other airports. Did you want to just briefly, I know we want to keep moving on and keep our pace going here, but did you want to briefly mention that point you made about why having those problems actually is a good sign versus some of the other airports that don't? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, they were uh, we were lucky enough to learn about it at AOPA. Sometimes it comes from our members. Sometimes we get uh, the word through our uh, flight school folks or the flying club uh, folks up at headquarters. Sometimes we get uh, local board members who are happen to be pilots that call us and uh, tell us what's going on. Uh, so uh, it's a the source of these inputs to us uh, doesn't really matter. Once we get involved, we can sort it out and help it. And our goal is to uh, do this to improve the, the the whole of GA. You know, the, in, uh, in one of the seminars I deliver, uh, there's uh, so many good things happening in general aviation now with uh, the OEMs and avionics and, and new products and new pilots coming to market, the, the, the flight training advantages improving things there. And it's just a lot of green arrows. You know, our high school initiative is bringing more kids into aviation. I mean, this is a lot of green arrows if you look at the dashboard. And unfortunately, the airport uh, segment of the dashboard still has a big fat red arrow next to it. And that's because we're not we're not building airports. We're we're, we're at five thousand eighty eight public use airports in this country, and we had over seven thousand in the seventies. So we're down two thousand airports since the seventies. Now you know that that's a that's a bumper sticker for a big crisis. Granted, there were many airports that were probably excess left over from World War II days, and the towns and counties that were granted those airports for free probably couldn't handle them. So I'm not saying that all 2000 needed to be saved, but I, I do uh, look at this as we are seeing more airports under threat of closure today for the wrong reasons that are important airports. Reed Hillview is one of them. Santa Monica is another. Uh, East Hampton, if that closes under these threats, that'll be a terrible loss to that to that economy up there. Uh, Linden Airport, New Jersey is another one. So uh, the closure threat we take very seriously and we, we fight vigorously to, to uh, improve that. Cool. All right. So let's go ahead and, and move on to the some of the I know we we're going to get into specific issues. We want to make sure we get to those. We're at 20 past the hour. Um, and so with our best practices, what are some of the things you would tell uh, these folks to, to sort of get themselves ready to, to build these good relationships? 
Well, as a as a flight school owner or manager, uh, I would imagine it's in your best interest to uh, keep the uh, expenses down and the revenues up. The revenues stay up when you have customers coming through the front door, and a lot of those customers are probably uh, locally based. You know, coming in for a flight review or an instrument uh, rating add on or multi or whatever. So uh, playing nice in the pond is certainly the right way to go in business. But uh, if you, uh, I'll say first and foremost, if you have an issue at your airport and you want to get some help with it, by all means, call AOPA, either come through Chris or Steven or go through the Pilot Information Center or capture my information at the end here. But we'd love to hear from you directly. And we're the ones in the company that do this stuff. So whoever you contact, they'll get it to us. But if you have an issue with an airport, get it, get it to us and we'll figure out if we can help. But uh, the things that flight schools can do is be aware of the, that there's a thing called an airport compliance manual, and it's the 5190.6B, uh, uh, and it's amended several times. But it is the Bible for airport managers. A lot of what an airport manager can and cannot do is prescribed in this manual. Uh, most of it is driven by the 39 grant assurances that the federal government imposes if you take the, the federal grant money, which is 90% of the project cost at most airports, uh, which is a great deal. But if you take that 90% free money for a, a big project, runway or taxiway improvement, uh, you accept the 39 grant assurances, which requires the airport not to discriminate against any aeronautical user. You can't, the airport manager cannot uh, ban uh, paragliders, for example. Uh, what they can do is manage it and mitigate the risks and encourage them to, you know, get everybody talking and have the paragliders do their flying at, at dawn and dusk when the winds are most favorable for them and maybe put a NOTAM out or put it on the AWOS. I mean, there's, there's ways to get around the safety problems that everybody thinks exists at first. Of course, there's high speed and slow speed traffic at, at the same time, but there are ways to mitigate that. And, and there's plenty of examples we could vector uh, airports to to help them find the best practice that's worked in other airports in the same situation. Another thing is to understand your airport's minimum standards. Uh, most airports have a published minimum standards or rules and standards document. It's generally what prescribes the rules for a flight school or a flying club or a maintenance shop to be created. Uh, and again, the airport has to make sure there's no discrimination. Grant assurance number 22 requires no discrimination against uh, businesses at the airport and no exclusive rights can be given. So no airport can, can tell a, any business on the airport, okay, you're gonna be our business on the airport and we're not gonna let anybody else in. That's a surefire way to get a, to get a, a, a complaint to the air, a FAA uh, submitted. So uh, if there's a flight school on the field and another flight school wants to come in, the airport has very specific rules they have to follow and the new flight school has very specific rules to follow to be accepted into the minimum standards and then and then basically come into the airport and, and operate. Uh, another thing that we see as a best practice is for all the tenants, flight schools included, to be aware of, join, or help form a pilot airport tenant association. Uh, every time we have an issue at an airport, it's the, one of the first things we check during this annual inspection we do is, is there a pilot tenant group? Is there a pilot group that's already uh, created? Whether it's ad hoc or official, uh, if that, organization exists we then find out is it is it functional is it is it alive is the address list current and can we get the the 10 or 20 of those members on the on a call like this uh, to have a quick uh, chat about what the issues are if there is a group we use it if there's not a group we instantly help form one because it is the best way to get the pilot's voice heard and uh, two-way conversation going with airport management uh, when there's a big issue it's all about good relationships and uh, understanding what the limits are of an airport manager and how they can work. Uh, in some cases, they're not authorized to exercise original thought because the manual says here's how it's going to be and it may not make sense, but we can tell you there's all kinds of case law and uh, federal statute that's behind it. So let's uh, anything else to add there, Chris or Stephen? No, I think that's that's pretty good. I think the, the key part there is that is that I know that minimum standards is really key to make sure you if you aren't familiar with it to go find that out and also be aware too that in some cases the airport may not have a minimum standards document. I have come across that with folks trying to start flight schools and and they go and they the airport manager they just sort of adopt 5190.6b. Again, even more important to them be familiar with it. So yeah. those are all great tips. So I'd, I'd say let's go ahead and keep moving and let's get into some of these these issues and and I know some of these folks will be um, interested in those. Yeah. So the first one, lease agreements. 
Yeah, we we have a ton of issues that come in, and uh, first thing we uh, when we start uh, doing the annual inspection, and I'll, I'll use that term a lot, but when we take this issue into the hangar and figure out what's really going on, uh, we quickly and the lease issues that come in, we quickly come up against a uh, uh, the legal flag is raised. So none of us in the regional manager ranks or myself, none of us are lawyers, uh, and uh, we will uh, consult with our general counsel staff up at headquarters and see what they think. If it's generic, but almost in all cases, a lease issue with a hangar lease or a flight school lease or whatever, uh, we will instantly vector that person to uh, one of our uh, legal panel attorneys in the state that they're in. Uh, the best way to handle a lease, a lease issue, if it's if it's going to go the legal route, is to get an attorney who's licensed in that state uh, who also understands the airport compliance manual, and that's exactly what our our legal service panel of attorneys do. So we'll, in most cases, we'll take the lease agreement issues and send them down the legal route. Uh, in the cases that we can help them, it's so generic that it's as simple as saying, please read your lease, please understand what the limits are, and then we explain to them what the airport compliance manual and the FAA practice is. And with a lease, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a flight school or an FBO or a maintenance facility or anything else or a private owner who wanted to build a box hanger, uh, the lease is for the land under the building. Uh, maybe you lease the building and the property, maybe you lease the property and build the building. But in every case, a lease is just that. It's not a it's not a purchase agreement. It's not a it's not a bill of sale. And every lease, uh, and we have a lot of issues with airport hangar owners, uh, you know, in privately owned hangars where uh, after 20 or 30 years, it's their hangar. It's their hangar. They painted it three times. They put their pictures up. They've got their, their toolboxes in there. It's their hangar. And uh, when the airport says sometimes five years prior, sometimes six months prior to lease expiration, they'll say, we've decided to revert the hangar to our ownership. And it's it's a bloody murder call. And, and uh, usually that's one of the hardest educational calls we have to give to our members is, you must read your lease. We recommend they contact an attorney. However, the four options for the end of every single lease are the lease can be renewed, which is a brand new lease. The lease can be extended. The airport could ask the lessee to remove the improvement on the land, which is expensive and doesn't do anybody any good. Or the airport can revert the hangar to their ownership and then turn right around and say to the current owner, would you like to lease this from us after we own it? Uh, and again, that's a tough pill to swallow for some hangar owners uh, who uh, are on lease land after 20 or 30 years. So leases are highly charged emotionally and generally require uh, uh, an attorney to help uh, educate and, and uh, guide the member through the issue. We, we don't generally get involved with flight school lease issues. Generally, the flight schools will go the legal route first, but uh, if we can help, we certainly will. Uh, again, it's all about the healthy ecosystem. Yep. And in fact, one of the questions that we saw in the chat as well is just because you mentioned several times the minimum standards again. Um, and so if someone was asking where do they find it, I know Elizabeth was kind enough to, to say generally see the airport manager for that. Do you have any other tips for people that may not know where the minimum standards are, say if the airport manager doesn't know? Well, if the airport uh, manager doesn't know, we're in much bigger problems. <laughs> uh, minimum standards are locally developed and locally approved. They are not approved by the FAA. There, there's, uh, I don't, maybe the FAA might describe what minimum standards are and should include, but they're 100% locally written. So I would start with a county, city, or township uh, or authority website. Uh, and if the airport manager can't vector you to that, uh, my chance, my hunch is it's a brand new airport manager or, or you're in really big trouble. <laughs> Good tips are good to look for that. All right, let's let's keep moving. I know we're uh, we're at 30 past, and so uh, another topic that often comes up that we'll hear about. And we've got a couple of good ones. We're going to try to see if we can address before we talk about how to resolve them. Um, the next one we've got on is sometimes we have disagreements with flying clubs that will pop up as an issue. Um, so what is what's your advice there on on how to handle that? Yeah. Um... Yes, that happens uh, at a couple of airports that we've been involved with, and I think it happens a lot more frequently than maybe we even hear about in the airport uh, side of the house. But uh, I've heard uh, accusations, face-to-face -face, uh, meetings with airport or with flight school owners that uh, AOPA is only cares about flying clubs and they hate flight schools. 
And as much as I, a government advocate, lobbyist, can try to, uh, you know, diffuse that, it's hard. Uh, but but I mean, the truth is, is we care about flying clubs and flight schools. We care about everything. I and mean, you're you're talking the folks organizing this this connector own that program on in all aspects. Uh, so the disagreements generally come about because a flying club may be maybe too aggressively holding itself out as a as a flight instruction source, which is then in direct competition with a flying a flight school, which is more likely a brick and mortar with a lot more overhead costs. And that's generally what we see as the beginning of the issue. Um, but uh, it's mostly an educational issue. Uh, in those cases where we get involved with those disputes, we encourage the airport manager to resolve it at their level. It's generally resolvable by reviewing the, the, the 5190 and making sure there's conversation with flying clubs and flight schools. And in most cases, we've had flying clubs that have been very uh, willing to fix the, the website if once we showed them what the rules were or connected them with uh, Chris's colleagues up at, up at the You Can Fly Academy. And uh, and they didn't even know that they were uh, doing something wrong. And that's the that's the best news about it is people are very eager to to do it right and and play nice. But uh, in some cases, it's the uh, it's the accusation of uh, they're out to get me, and I'm going to do everything I can to crush them. And those are really hard cases to 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 solve. We we've got that going on in Santa Barbara right now. It's it's kind of a mess. But uh, I would say uh, for the flight schools, don't assume malicious intent. Until you have all the facts, <clears throat> if you want to help help with it, call us, call Chris, call Steve Bateman, and we'll be happy to engage and figure out what we can on your behalf. And uh, in the end, it's all about the references that are listed here on this chart, and that's the guiding document to this this whole issue. And in fact, I just put the links to both of those documents just for your reference. You can also just Google these to find them, but I put the two links right there in the chat for you. So in case you want to go look at those specifically in 5190.6b, you want to look at chapter 10 and there's a section there on flying clubs. Uh, and then there's this 2016 amendment uh, to that that really clarifies it. And just to be clear, it, the FAA is very clear that, that flying clubs are not to be holding out for flight training, but they are allowed to let people that are in their aircraft, just like if you bought your own aircraft, to train in them. So it's about just finding that that right balance um, and doing that. So check that stuff out. And like I said, Steve Bateman is a great resource. I'm glad to talk to you as well. Um, and I'm sure that if we needed to help you, any of us would uh, to do that. And in fact, and I will say, I want to just reiterate what Mike said too. We have, I've had, just in the past month, I have, I think it's been two, maybe even three flying clubs that we come across that are holding out. We've contacted them and they changed it because they didn't realize that they weren't in compliance. So it's like, I don't think that people are out there trying to do that. In some cases that might, might be the case, but I think that I feel like it's maybe a little more on the off than it is the, the typical thing. All right, this one is a big one we know because of Reed uh, Hillview. So please, Mike, tell us what we can do to be prepared for this. Because as you mentioned, this is something that it looks like might be coming everybody's way. Uh, I know that our president, Mark Baker, was just talking about this too. Let it fuel. Yeah, um, definitely a, uh, a hot topic. So um, everybody probably understands that uh, lead is is dangerous. It's That's been being removed from our society ever since we got lead out of auto fuel. Uh, un, unleaded auto fuel is now the, the norm, obviously. Uh, leaded avgas is also the norm, low lead, uh, and it is the only source of airborne lead now uh, uh, coming from GA piston-powered aircraft. Uh, it is a microscopic level compared to what we used to see in the 70s before the, the, the ban on lead came out. Uh, when that all happened, uh, the aviation industry and the FAA uh, were in conversations with the EPA and the PAFI initiative was started, the Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative, and for uh, probably 15 years, uh, Elizabeth may know a better, better start date, uh, but it's been a long time uh, that the uh, PAFI initiative has been alive and well. AOPA is a member of the PAFI steering group with other major aviation associations and the FAA. So we're at the table and it meets periodically and uh, there is a very well uh, organized process and uh, and plan to introduce unleaded 100 octane aviation fuel uh, to the system and the requirements that the industry has demanded and the FAA agrees is the uh, the fuel that is 
created someday, and there's a lot of people working on it, has to be a plug and play drop in replacement where the same infrastructure, the same pumps, the same aircraft, the same carburetors, uh, same turbochargers, everything has to be same, same and meet the ASTM standards set by the FAA uh, as leaded fuel. And over the years, there have been several recipes that have been offered by the different participants in PAFI and some of the some of the vendors that are outside of the PAFI initiative. But everybody's scrambling to find this magical formula for unleaded 100 octane fuel. And uh, to date, it has been elusive. Uh, the, the formulas that have been tested have uh, have all had a uh, some issue with them at the 130, 150 hour point where the plugs start fouling, mostly on the higher compression engines. Uh, you could get a PhD studying the PAFI initiative and the formulas for uh, unleaded 100 octane fuel uh, so that it looks and smells and acts like leaded fuel and all the things, all the benefits that lead brings to the high, com uh, high compression engines. But uh, Basically, uh, suffice to say that we are all committed still, AOPA, the uh, the industry, and the FAA to the PAFI initiative, and it will be uh, getting more scrutiny and more pressure and hopefully uh, uh, help uh, find a better solution faster. Right now, there's 100 uh, octane uh, fuel that's out from GAMI, and you may have seen the press releases around Oshkosh timeframe. Um, we're dying to see, uh, very excited to see how the, the large-scale large testing goes on that. Uh, the FAA did issue a, a STC for that, and I think it's approved for most of the aircraft in the flight training fleet, so 180 horsepower engines, I think, or less. And Elizabeth and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the target for the test audience now. I don't know how widely it's being used yet as a, in a test case, but that's that's the next step for that fuel is to test it and see if it works. Um, and as a fairly new old Bonanza owner, I'm very interested to see how it, the testing goes eventually on the 300 horsepower motors because that's that's what I care about. So in the meantime, uh, Swift Fuels introduced this is years ago a an unleaded 94 octane fuel. And that did have the qualities uh, that were needed in the lower uh, the lower compression engines. So that's approved for, I think, 180 horsepower and less. And it's doing very well. Uh, in fact, Swift, if you look at the Swift website, they're in about 28 or 29 airports now. So it's not widely, widely used, but it, they're, they're aggressively marketing it. And uh, I'll just say that uh, that's an option uh, if, if flight schools want to use that, but it introduces the things that we don't that we don't want to see the, the end state being. It introduces a separate supply chain, separate storage capacity, uh, separate trucks to deliver it. And that's exactly what we didn't want to see as an industry is uh, bifurcating the industry into, into two different sources, which uh, means it's uh, probably not going to be as economically profitable right. or healthy. So uh, Reed Hillview is our current uh, front line on this one, the Santa Clara Clara County Board of Supervisors voted on June 7, or August 17th to uh, remove the lead from all operations at the airport and to also expeditiously seek uh, closure of the airport 10 years before their grant assurances expire. So uh, it's all about a lead study that they conducted. Reed Hillview is a very uh, encroached airport. There are, uh, it's high density, uh, low income housing in two or three quadrants of the airport, very close to the fence line. And the study they commissioned, um, let me just caveat this with the Santa Clara, Clara County Board of Supervisors has been trying to close Reed Hillview Airport since the 90s. My predecessor beat them with a three to two vote to save the airport in 96. They never gave up their desire to redevelop that land. And I'm telling you for three decades, they've been trying to close the airport. We've been winning and keeping it open. Uh, the last tactical move was they, they they commissioned a lead study that was focused on what is the impact to lead on children under the age of 18 and mostly infants. And they did a very well uh, peer reviewed study uh, with uh, California uh, health statistics um, that showed an irrefutable connection to lead poisoning in children near Reed Hill U Airport. And it's based on half mile, one mile, one and a half mile rings. And there was nothing we could find in it that was technically inaccurate, but it's a damning report for Reed Hillview. 
uh, and they used that study to convince the other two board members to agree to seek closure of the airport at when they can. The good news is the FAA is not interested at all in closing that airport. They have 10 years of, on their grant assurances and it's a reliever airport to San Jose. There's a thousand reasons why that airport should stay open. Um, uh, we have been unsuccessful in converting the closure advocates on the board uh, to see the value of the airport. All they see is low income housing and land and retail and public transit. They see, they see more, uh, more growth other than the airport. So Reed Hillview is our front line right now. You'll see plenty of stuff written in our in our news publications. Uh, we're committed to PAFI. That's the most important part. And what can you do as a flight school? Number one is pay attention to what's going on politically in your in your town. If lead becomes a big rallying cry, we need to know that yesterday if we're not already involved. So I would really ask everybody on the call if, if lead is something you're hearing about in the news, or you see it pop up on maybe the uh, if you're paying attention, uh, pay attention to the agenda items of the monthly council meetings, board meetings or authority meetings. And if lead starts creeping into the conversation, we need to know that please right away because we're we're, we're building quite a little task force here to to start fighting. What I think is going to happen is, is other towns are going to follow uh, the, the lead of Reed Hillview and they're going to start claiming this this impact of lead uh, in the vicinity of the airport. Uh, nobody at AOPA will defend lead. We know it's uh, it's harmful at any level. We also know if you right size the problem, nobody has the problem like Reed Hillview does because they don't have homes within a couple hundred yards of the runway. So uh, anyway, lead's a big deal. We're very, very uh, tuned into it and uh, the it's going to start getting more attention. But PAFI's been around for a long time. It's well funded. It's a great industry government initiative, and I think it'll be the path to success. So I'll stop on that. Great. Thank you, Mike, on that. And so what we're going to do, too, is just for the sake of time, I think we'll we'll just jump. We were going to do hangers, but let's go ahead and jump to what they can do just in general for any issues. And then I want to make sure we have time for that Q&A. So let's Perfect. go ahead and do that. And if we want to come back to hangers, we certainly can do that. But yeah, let's how do people go about whatever the issue is whether it's one of these or something else and, and we've got a couple that we'll talk about what do they do what's the best practice here well talk to the people involved uh, certainly the airport manager let the, let the airport manager know there's an issue or complaint or maybe the possible complaint and let them work it out it's, their, it's in their best interest to do that if you need help or guidance by all means call us uh, we we do not roll in on the first call of an issue with a, a big stick and 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 uh, we don't we don't come in, in an aggressive way. We we do exactly what we're telling you to do, which is call the airport manager, find out what's going on. Uh, if there is a uh, resolution that's possible, we ask uh, that the the airport manager include the pilots, tenants at the table to hear their voice. Usually, that comes in when we're doing minimum standards reviews, and maybe they're going to try to disenfranchise one or two groups of the of the aviation user system. Uh, getting those users to the table is the key, and that's a formalized way for us to say, hey, if you're going to have a meeting on these minimum standards, have a couple of town halls on it or pilot town halls on it, and let's let's hear what the pilots think. And generally, with our help to the airport manager, we'll show them why they can or can't do what they're trying to do in the in the uh, airport compliance manual, and all of a sudden everybody's talking and, and it works out. Um, so please involve us if you think we can be helpful. We'll cons consider us uh free consultants i guess <laughs> on airport work uh if an issue explodes to the point where it cannot be resolved uh anybody at an airport can issue or can submit a part 13 complaint which is considered an informal complaint and that could be as simple as a phone call to the airport district office uh, in your region or a letter uh usually it's done with a letter and it's uh, hey i've got an issue here and uh, and uh, it's here's my complaint uh, the uh, the part 13 process it's a it's a it's a it's written about in the airport compliance manual but it's it's resolved at the local district office the airport district office it's a it's a uh, uh, not binding but it's close to binding uh, what will happen is uh, the airport district office will review the case they'll determine if there's a uh, a compliance problem and if there is a compliance problem, meaning they're not in compliance with the grant assurances, they will issue what's called a corrective action plan that's issued to the airport manager to resolve it. Uh, if that airport manager gets the uh, corrective action plan, it might be that the airport manager is required to revise a lease uh, 
uh, with a leaseholder because the leaseholder is the source of the problem. Could be a mechanic, could be a maintenance shop, could be a, a flight school, could be anything, an FBO. But uh, the the relationship is between the FAA and the airport manager, uh, regardless of who the complainant is. Uh, if you issue a Part 13 complaint, uh, be ready for the FAA to stick to the Bible. So it'd be very smart for you to know the Bible before you write your complaint, uh, which is the compliance manual, and you may not win. Uh, if you don't like the results of the Part 13, or you know this is a very big, big issue, maybe you've already consulted with an attorney, there is another process called a Part 16 complaint. Those issues are handled at FAA headquarters. It's quasi-legal. Uh, it takes up to two years to resolve, and that does have the weight of uh, almost the same weight as a, as a court ruling when it comes out, but it still results in a, in a corrective action plan to the sponsor, to the airport, uh, to resolve the issue. If a Part 16 complaint is issued and the corrective action plan is not adhered to, their funding is at risk. So if you know you're on strong ground and you think you want to go Part 16, we don't recommend it, but it, generally you have to get an attorney on your side first, which is coming out of your pocket, and, uh, and then you can go the Part 16 route. It's going to take two years, but if you get a finding in your favor, then uh, you, you're much farther down the road to... Uh, to resolving the issue. Again, that's the last step. We always try to resolve these at the lowest level first. Right, and obviously, right. yeah, totally, last resort. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was just gonna say, what about before you have an issue? Because all of these steps, they're really important and, and hopefully they get you to resolution. But what should you be doing right now today before you have a really specific issue to deal with? Run a great flight school, be friendly with everybody and uh, stay competitive and stay profitable and uh, be friendly with your airport and uh, we would tell the same thing to our members or to flight instructors or mechanics or flying clubs is is uh, play nice in the sandbox it's better for everybody build those relationships now yeah exactly and that way you try to head off things and listen to people before any of this happens before we get yeah. to all this because it gets you know, messy. The, the, the funny part is when you get done with a even a, a mild resolution or maybe a part 16 resolution you're all still working in the same sandbox a year after right. this is over so you might as well start talking now, you know. <laughs> cool. We've got, we are at 47. So I want to just, uh, can yeah. you just give us a quick um, intro to the airport? Support? I want to make sure we have time for that Q&A. Uh, yeah, I'll just, folks uh, two questions. seconds. Uh, we have 1,900 members that have volunteered to be our air, airport support network around the country. Uh, they're like our eyes and ears out there to alert us to issues when they start popping up. Um, we do get a lot of issues through our network, which is great. A lot of the issues come in through other members, other other entities. But if uh, what I would just say about this is, if you're a flight school, uh, do you know that? Do you know if you have an airport support network volunteer at your airport? And if you do, who is it? And you ought to have a relationship with them. If you don't have one at your airport, you can look it up at aopa.org/asn. Uh, find a volunteer, and if you don't find a volunteer there, consider uh, you or one of your instructors uh, signing up to be a volunteer. I'd love to talk to you about it, and uh, that's all we have to talk about that. Perfect. Thank you. And then just right here, I know you've got the, just the map to show whatever state you're in. These are our regional managers, and again, we want to get to that Q&A, so I don't know if, if Mike, you want to just yeah, mention quickly the role of the regional that's manager. Good yeah, we got seven regional managers plus me and two other folks here. We're here to help you, so go ahead and go to the next chart. Perfect. All right, so let me go ahead and I wanted to magically do it, but uh, let me just go ahead and take the issues. We had two issues that came up in our chat and obviously we'll be more than happy to entertain more, but I we had um, an, Felipe. Uh, yep, yes. not with CFI. I see airport, security. airport security was from Susan. So, yes, sir, how's it going? This is Felipe, I believe. Hello? Go ahead, Felipe. Yep. We yes, sir, no. Uh, uh, recently, we had an issue uh, in our uh, local airport where our instructor had a non-compete with another location where they couldn't teach in our uh, in our local airport. And um, trying to see if by any chance would that something that something that could possibly fall under the you know the right of that instructor to to be able to teach in a publicly funded airport. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that. Uh... I can give you a hunch on an answer, but this one probably goes to local uh, laws and, uh, you know, non-compete is generally done when you leave one employer and go to another employer, uh, an employer who's had, you know, handcuffs on you for some amount of time might, might make you sign a non-compete so you don't, uh, 
you know, compete with them with all the skills that you learn from the current employer. I mean, so not competes are normal out there. Uh, they're generally not done. I don't, I, I don't hear, hear a lot about these in, in airport issues with where a CFI, you're saying a CFI leaves one flight school and has to sign a non-compete to not go get employed by another flight school? Is that what you're talking about? Well, they sign it at the beginning and then they go to another school and, and they work at another school, either because they got terminated or because they, you know, they, they decided to go to another location. Well, if they already signed it, then that, that's definitely a legal issue. Now you're trying to get out of a contract, right? So, Correct. That's that would be the case, and it's you know if it's something that is as legal as a flight school owner, can you can you have a non compete you know and limit somebody's right to a publicly funded airport? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I've never heard it posed that way, so I'd have to I'd have to ask you to call me directly, and I'll get you in touch with the expert on this stuff. But you're sure. asking is is it is it legal for a flight school to issue or for a, a flight school and a former employee to have a non-compete which then effectively denies access to flight instructing to that instructor who signed the non-compete is that what you're saying at a publicly funded airport correct right well the airport manager didn't impose that so my hunch is it's not going to be found to be a compliance problem it's more of a contract issue and if i know the faa like i think i know the faa as soon as they realize it's not a compliance issue. They're going to wipe their hands of it and say, go talk to an attorney. It's a, it's a contract law issue. I don't think on the surface, based on what you described, Philippe, I don't think that's a compliance issue. Gotcha. OK, cool. And you'll see Mike's uh, contact information here in just a moment. Um, but I know we've got the other issue, uh, airport security. Susan, I see you still on the call. Do you want to just describe a little bit uh, what you were concerned about? I think Susan's still there and you are muted right now if you need to unmute your microphone. Susan, okay. we can't hear you. Yes. Uh, I can talk generically about airport security uh, just because it does come up a lot. <clears throat> uh, airport security generally starts at 139 airports, part 139 certificated airports, which are airports that can or do have scheduled airline service. Um, not every airport that's 139 certified has scheduled service. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is an untowered airport that has a, it's a part 139 certification. If, if, it's, if it's part 139, regardless of how much traffic they have, they are required to satisfy TSA security protocols, which generally involves badging and fences and access control points. And that's the global summary of where the problems usually start. If an airport grows and gets a 139 certification, now you've got all these grandfathered in tenants who never had to worry about locked gates or accesses and badges and all that. So that's usually where the problems arise. Um, we engage where we can to right size the security measures. There's no one recipe for security at a, that an airport manager can choose. There's many options and we can bring to bear best practices that have allowed them to satisfy the rules and and not be onerous with the folks that now have to deal with this new security regime. And that's generally what we see with security issues. Thanks, Mike. It looks like Susan's just having trouble unmuting, so she is there. Um, so Susan, maybe uh, just try to type your, uh, if you can type your question or issue, or just a brief description. If not, we're gonna go to the next slide here in a second. You'll see Mike's direct contact as well, but maybe yeah. type it up and let's just go ahead and do that really quick and then we'll, uh, take any other and anybody else if you have any other topics uh issues questions uh, please throw those in the chat or raise your hand we'll be glad to, to have you unmute and, and tell us about it um what i wanted to do really quick was just while we're letting that happen um this is mike's contact information right here it's the aopa airport support network uh and there is his title and there's his email mike.ginter at aopa.org so very much appreciate you being willing to share that with the folks and um, hopefully they'll oh, there we go thanks elizabeth um it's in the chat there as well uh and so let us know if you have any other issues or other questions does any, anyone any else questions yeah any questions yeah all right all right and then uh did you we've got just a couple minutes left here mike did you want to touch on the before we just wrap things up the hangar issue at all we did kind of skip over that and did you have any like top sure yeah, you go, go back to that chart i'll just touch on it so uh in the uh four a little over four years i've been here um 
you know, we tried to get our arms around how to manage the, the size of the problem better, which led to that airport prog pro uh, prog uh, project management software to track all the airport issues. Uh, the other thing we've heard anecdotally forever, I've been flying for 41 years, is there's a hangar shortage. So now I'm in a position to try to dig into it, and it's near and dear to our boss's heart, and every pilot uh, who's on a waiting list is near and dear to their heart. So we're starting to tackle that. And uh, and we've conducted a survey with our, our uh, 1900 ASN volunteers, 800 or so have answered, and we've done, we've completed a survey in the state of Pennsylvania. That's complete now with 116 public use airports. We're initiating surveys now in California and Nebraska. We'll be starting two other states before the end of the year, uh, statewide surveys of all the all the GA airports. Basically, what we're asking is uh, questions about how many airport, how many hangars, uh, what's the condition of the hangars, how are they, how are they funded, uh, are they owned and operated by the sponsor, or are they owned and operated privately on leased land? General pictures on the on the hangar landscape, and then is there a waiting list? How long do people wait on the waiting list? And do you have land to build hangars if you wanted to? And if you have a list and land, what's the number one reason you're not building hangars? And the answers were eye-opening uh, in, in the state of Pennsylvania. And this generally generally works throughout the country so far. 71% uh, of the airports have a waiting list. Um, generally, uh, airports that have hangars that are under sponsor control, 45% of the gross revenue comes from hangar revenue and 45% comes from fuel revenue. So that told us that hangars are a major contributor to the to the gross revenue of an airport's uh, coffers um, when those hangars are operated and owned by the sponsor, by the airport operator. Um, the uh, number one reason why airports do not build hangars when there's a demand signal and the space to build is availability of funding. Uh, anybody who's looked at this issue as a as a as a hangar renter or hangar builder or airport manager. Uh, they'll tell you that, yep, AIP funding is there. That's the one that pays 90% of a project in, in the state and, and the airport only share 5% each. Uh, airport uh, improvement pro program funding is eligible to fund hangar projects. However, it, that's only going to happen if every other safety and capacity project is funded and complete, which means you're never going to get funding for a hangar through AIP funding. That's just the way it is. So uh, because funding is the number one issue, there's a large number of airports with a waiting list, which means it affects many, many of our 300,000 plus members. Uh, we think the solution is, is out there. In fact, Senator Jim Inhofe introduced the Hangar Act right before Oshkosh, uh, which was uh, an initiative to uh, provide some funding for primary entitlement airports and non-primary entitlement airports. So all airports, different funds and money for each. Uh, we care about the non-primary entitlement airports because that's the GA airports. And if there was a funding source for hangars, uh, that would uh, we think would go a long way to uh, allowing airport sponsors to build hangars that are on their land, that they don't lease out the land for private developers, which is not certainly, a, a, we're not a, opposed to that, but in a perfect world, I'd love to see airports build the hangars so they can service the debt in 10 to 12 years and keep all of the revenue after that, which then goes towards their 5% of, uh, of of future projects. You know, if uh, I did a case study in one case, it's they had uh, two rows of 12 T hangers each and their uh, their total gross revenue for a year for both of those hangers once they're paid off was 75 grand a year. And when you extrapolate that to 5%, they could get a $1.5 million AIP project funded with the 5% of their hangar, of their hangar income. And that's before the county kicks money in or before they use other fuel revenues or, I mean, it's a huge force multiplier. So we think it's gonna be good for the GA fleet. It'll preserve the life of the fleet. It's not getting any younger. Um, we think that uh, there's a ton of airports that have airplanes on, on tie down pads. And uh, we also know that all waiting lists are not created equal. Uh, 45, 50, 60 percent of the people will jump at a hangar when asked. The other 40, 50 percent won't. They're just sitting on the list waiting till maybe they buy an airplane. So um, there you go. That's our hangar story. We're doing something about it. We're going to finish getting the data and we're going to push for a solution nationwide and see if we can't uh, remove the obstacles to fixing the hangar problem. That sounds like a great solution too. And I know that a lot of flight schools end up having to tie down things or might have their own hangar, but I'm sure having that availability will be great and it would help the health of the airport. 
All right. Well, what I want to do is thank you again, Mike. I want to wrap things up here. Um, thank you again, Mike, for joining us. Mike Ginter, his email is in the chat there. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Know that next month um, we are on October 6th at noon, the normal time, that first Wednesday of the month. We're going to do how to host a great flight school event. So we have two or one or two of our uh, AOPA um, event planners that will be on with us, and they will give you their tips on how to host an event. Um, and in the meantime, if you need to get hold of us, don't forget FT initiative at AOPA.org, or you can obviously uh, contact Stephen or me. Uh, we'll be glad to help you out and point you in the right direction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks again for Elizabeth for helping out too. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.